Now, we could ask a question, or with a couple of other things I should mention here in this, in this uh, rapidly cycling part of the carbon cycle. The slight imbalance in uh, carbon associated with the cycling between the atmosphere and the biosphere system, a very small amount of carbon ends up in the rivers and is carried into the oceans. So that sort of couples the ocean and atmosphere part of the carbon cycle with the biosphere and atmosphere part of the carbon cycle, which includes both marine organisms and, and terrestrial organisms. So the question we might ask is, how long does a typical carbon molecule stay in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide in the context of what I've just been discussing, the rapidly cycling uh, carbon removed from the atmosphere by photosynthesis, carbon goes back from respiration, carbon comes out of the oceans when they get warmer, carbon goes back into the oceans. How long does an average carbon dioxide molecule stay in the atmosphere? Because of those processes alone, the average carbon dioxide, the average carbon molecule stays in the atmosphere only about five years only about five years. Now, that's a lot longer than the one week for a water molecule, but it's fairly short in the grand scheme of things. So why do we worry about excess carbon going into the atmosphere? Here's why, and this is the subtle point, the key point we need to understand. Any carbon we put in the atmosphere joins that rapidly cycling system, cycling through the biosphere, the ocean surface waters and back into the atmosphere. So of the carbon we put in the atmosphere, it turns out that roughly, if, if, if we put a kilogram of carbon in the atmosphere or a ton of carbon in the atmosphere, about half of that ton ends up cycling through that system continually. So even though the carbon dioxide molecules we put in the atmosphere remain there only about five years on average, they are rapidly cycled back, at least about half of them. So if we put a ton of carbon in the atmosphere, turns out about half of it ends up in the soils and the ocean waters and stays there. And we don't fully understand that breakdown and that's a, an area of, of, of active research. It's called the carbon sink. Where does the carbon go? But the other half that we put in the atmosphere, even though it's pulled out by processes like photosynthesis, it quickly goes back. And so when we add carbon to the atmosphere, it stays there for a long time. And the five years I talked about as being the typical resonance time for carbon in the atmosphere is misleading. It's correct, but it's misleading because it suggests that, well, we put carbon in, it'll all be gone after five years. It won't be all gone because it will be participating in that cycle and it will go right back into the atmosphere. So the key idea is carbon is going to stay in the atmosphere a lot longer than its five-year resonance time. How much longer? That depends on two other processes that are involved in the very long-term removal of carbon from the atmosphere. And the two important processes both occur in the ocean and they take carbon from the surface waters down into the very deep ocean where it really has a hard time escaping. There are about 39,000 gigatons of carbon in the deep ocean, a vast amount compared to anything that's anywhere else in the carbon cycle, and it has very little role to play, at least in this short-term climate cycle. How does stuff get down there? Well, one of the main drivers is something called the biological pump. If you're a tiny marine plankton or even a fish or something, you eventually die and you eventually sink to the bottom, and you've got carbon that was ultimately fixed from atmospheric carbon by photosynthetic processes, whether you're a plant or an animal, and when you sink to the bottom, you take that carbon with you, and that carbon is removed permanently from the rapidly cycling part of the carbon cycle. That's called the biological pump, and that takes down something on the order of about 10 or 11 gigatons per year. There's another process called upwelling, two other processes called upwelling and diffusion that bring up deep waters and bring some carbon back up into the surface waters. And that brings up almost as much as the biological pump pumps downward, the biological pump being this decay of, of dead organisms, but not quite. And so there's a net removal of about two gigatons of carbon to the deep ocean. And at least on timescales of hundreds to thousands to hundreds of thousands of years, that carbon is lost. And so there is a net way of removing carbon from the system, but because that flow is so slow, it takes hundreds to thousands of years to remove carbon from the cycle. In fact, I've seen a recent study that suggests that some small fraction of the carbon that we might put in the atmosphere will remain for timescales up to 30 or 35,000 years. That's a long time. So if you say, what is the resonance time for carbon in the atmosphere? To be honest, I have to say it's five years roughly, but then I have to add, but the carbon remains in the rapidly cycling system of the atmosphere, the biota, the surface waters, and so on, for timescales. And this is where it gets ambiguous. But anything from hundreds to thousands of years is a good answer there. A nice even number is 1,000 years. Some people use 300 years. There is no exact number for that. Some of it remains a lot longer, some of it shorter. 
but somewhere on the order of hundreds to thousands or a few thousand years is the typical resonance time for carbon, not in the atmosphere alone, but in that rapidly cycling time. That's the time it will take to remove any carbon we add from that system. That is the big, huge key idea here that, that you have to understand to realize why any anthropogenic carbon affects the carbon cycle and the atmospheric carbon concentration and therefore the concentration of greenhouse gases and therefore the strength of the greenhouse effect for a long time. Now there are two additional processes I should just point out that occur on much longer timescales. One of them is important in the natural climate cycle and that is over long times this carbon that sunk to the deep ocean forms sedimentary rocks. Those rocks are eventually brought up through tectonic processes. They're brought to the surface again where they can weather and release their carbon or they're brought up through volcanoes and the carbon is eventually released into the atmosphere through volcanism. So over the time scale of millions and hundreds of millions of years, geological processes complete the cycle much more slowly and return that carbon that was moved to the deep ocean. The one other part, which is not terribly significant naturally, but is terribly significant for human beings, is that a very tiny fraction of the carbon that is removed from the atmosphere by photosynthetic plants and maybe gets incorporated into animals or maybe stays in plants and it dies and gets buried before it has a chance to decay and return its carbon to the atmosphere. So it too doesn't participate in that rapidly cycling part of the carbon cycle but instead remains buried underground where it undergoes chemical processes which eventually turn it into the fossil fuels, coal, oil and natural gas and those fuels have in them stored the solar energy that was fixed by photosynthetic organisms as they took that carbon out of the atmosphere and used solar energy to make it into new chemical compounds. That's where the fossil fuels came from. We don't know exactly how much fossil fuels are. One guess is there might be 10,000 gigatons. There might be half that, there might be twice that. We don't know. If we knew, we would better be able to predict how we're going to do in the next few decades. But that's where the fossil fuels came from. And they play very little role in the natural climate system because basically they just sit there under the ground. Uh, what we human beings have done, and this will be the subject of the next lecture, is a great deal with that carbon reservoir associated with the fossil fuels and that process. So let me pause now. We're through the first half of the course, and I'm going to give you a very quick review of what we have learned in the first half of this course because now we're going to move to the anthropogenic part, the part about human beings and our role in climate. We know that the Earth is warming. We know that it's been warming especially much in recent decades. We've seen that from the 150-year thermometer record. We've seen it from ice melt, from changes in weather patterns, from changes in species behavior, from species ranges, from, from springtime uh, events, and so on. We know it from paleoclimate reconstructions, which suggest, for example, that the warming is unprecedented over the past millennium, that the longer term shows this periodic pattern of ice ages and warm spells, that a planet's climate is established by this balance of incoming solar energy and outgoing infrared radiation, and that balance is affected by the presence of atmospheric greenhouse gases that make it harder for the infrared to escape and therefore warm the surface. For Earth, we know that water vapor and carbon dioxide cause a natural warming of about 33 degrees Celsius, and we know that there's a close correlation between temperature and atmospheric CO2 concentration. And finally, we know that carbon cycles through the Earth atmosphere system, and as it cycles through the system, um, it does so in a way that although the cycling is rapid and results in carbon remaining in the atmosphere itself only about, say, five years, that cycling occurs rapidly and the carbon is returned to the atmosphere, or much of it is returned to the atmosphere, and it's only those very slow processes that bring carbon into the deep ocean that eventually remove it and it takes those processes at least centuries and in some cases thousands of years to remove the carbon from the system. So the bottom line of the first half of the course is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causes a greenhouse effect which warms our planet. We know that to be true and we also know enough about the carbon cycle to know that any carbon we put in the atmosphere is going to remain there for a long time.